The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene. And from Boston, I'm Ed Jupin. Welcome to show number 12 of As We See It. And we have a pretty action-packed show here today, so welcome all of our listeners. Um, you picked a good time if this is your first show. We have a wide range of topics we're going to be discussing today, so we want to cut right to the chase without wasting any time. So let me just introduce today's panel. Of course, we have the host of uh, our show, Fred Boaz, along with the co-host, Holly Hurley. And we have a couple special guests today. We have BaseNet Internet Television's new national political correspondent, Tony Mazzucco, also joining us. Tony will be co-hosting a new show that we're going to have coming up uh, very shortly, um, at least through the political season. We'll see how it goes. We're going to be starting a political show called Viewpoint. So Tony is here for the first time on BaseNet, and uh, we'll get him in, into this conversation somewhat. And then also to discuss a topic, we have Larry the Lobster Marks, who all of you BaseNet fans know as the co-host of Holly and the Lobster. So as promised over the past few weeks, we are having, in a sense, a Holly and the Lobster reunion here today. So Fred and Holly, it's all yours, and uh, let's get number 12 on the road. Thanks, Ed. And Holly, I love the term co-host because I was talking Ed, about offering you the co-host position anyway. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, no, I mean, you bring a lot of, you bring a lot of interesting, uh, interesting aspects and a lot of interesting points and you make, you take the show into a new direction. So welcome aboard. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, this week's been taking up the, uh, mainstream media has been taking up the protests that have been going nationwide, what they call, um, uh, Occupy Wall Street. And, you know, it, it, it and other towns occupy Boston, no. occupy wherever. Right. Else. Well, I'm just going by by New York. There's nothing going on here, and pretty much not occupying Stroudsburg. Like, would make any difference? Well, you but, should get a <laughs> get a poster to hang around your uh, neck and go for it. I just don't. I just don't deal with Bank of America. But it all based. It, it, it's based on Wall. Uh, from what I understand, it's based on Wall Street, uh, Wall Street greed, or what they say. But Basically, what, what's getting people and what gets me mo angry most is a statement that was made by the CEO of Bank of America saying that they're going to be charging a $5 monthly fee on the use of ATM debit cards. And it's not the fact that they're charging the $5 a month that really angers me. It's the statement he made that, eh, well, what the hell, we're entitled to make a profit. And like, like we said in other shows, don't say stuff like that because you wind up pissing people off. Like me. And it's, it's not... The $5 a month service charge, that pisses me off. I could care less about paying $5 a month. I live, as all of you know, I live off of my debit card. I never carry cash. And so I use my debit card a gazillion times a month. So if you break down the gazillion times a month to $5 a month, it's going to cost me one-tenth of a cent every time I use my debit card. So it's not the $5. It's the principle of the thing. Well, especially because, I mean, Bank of America was a part of this huge bailout. Bank of America was a part of the mortgage crisis. They were a huge part of it. And I'm sorry, but you're getting handouts from the government, and then you're getting angry with us and with the government for wanting to regulate you after those handouts. You have not trickled down any of the money that they've given you yet. I'm not giving you $5. You crashed I, my whole I, economy. And there's no reason I should. <laughs> That's right. I don't owe you five dollars. Actually, they said, and "Oh, we have the right to make a profit." No, you what, don't. What really you annoys me though is when profit. you owe me and the government a lot of money right now. You have zero right to a profit. No right whatsoever. What annoys me most is when I go to one bank and I go to use the ATM card. They want to charge me a fee. My bank wants to charge me a fee. Now you want to charge me five dollars. Right. So you're going to get that. hammered multiple times now. Correct. And 
You know, I mean, when, and whether the crisis, you know, on Wall Street was started by Wall Street or by the government, that's a whole other show. But what happens is that people got to understand that these guys, and, and we all understand companies are in business to make a profit. Base nets in business to make a profit. We're not doing this for, you know, we're not doing this to, to have it cost us money. But what happens is that, you know, there gets a point where you say enough is enough. And this guy's attitude was just, just, excuse me, I got to put the disclaimer in. We will be, we can you we do you sometimes. Uh, explicit language because this is an adult show and this guy's just an asshole. I mean, I don't mean to put it that way, but what the guy said was just wrong. And this guy should be slapped, taken out, just, just slapped around and said, what are you, stupid? Because you know, you're going to lose customers just over that one statement. Lost to now, me. I, went I got, to a, I got I my went wife to checked our bank this for this. Yeah, this I went to a credit union this week. Yeah. Well, you know, that's actually a really good point. And a lot of people, you know, Susie Ormond's been saying for years that everyone should switch to credit unions because you make money on your money instead of losing and, money. And on you're your... an owner. You know, you're an owner in the bank. That's, that's right. right. And they and and they also, I mean, because of the way they're set up, you know, I mean, the principle is much more com customer driven. It's a much better investment for your money. And, and you know, you said, Fred, that they should be slapped around. And, they and I mean, they, they're going to. That's the. I mean, if if people like Ed are moving to a credit union, I mean, Ed's a, we're pretty mainstream people, you know. If people like Ed are moving to a credit union, then the world is taking notice. The the thing that got me is my mother was uh, has built the same bank, although it's changed ownership several times. She's built the same bank for over thirty years, and when she started out, she had free checking, and then it went to Bank of New York, and they decided they were going to charge her a fee. And she walked in, she said, "Wait, this is not what I signed up for. I've been with you guys for twenty five years." And I want the fees waived. They said, absolutely. They waived the fees on her. Because they don't want to lose the business. And they're going to lose the business. They're going to lose a lot. Of, and I got my wife checking on her bank. They play that game. I'm going to credit union. It's not personal. This is business. This is money that I, not, not that I can't afford it, but, you know, I shouldn't have to pay an extra service fee. I mean, if she wants a new card, if I want a new, a new ATM card, they want to charge me 10 bucks. Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. That's insanity. Ed, can I break in with a quick story here? Yes, you can. About 15, 20 years ago, this is a true story, my grandfather had been banking at the uh, Randolph Savings Bank pretty much the entire time we lived in town. We, we should mention Tony again for our listeners. Uh, Tony Mazuko is from uh, the south shore of Massachusetts, uh, Cape Cod area, so when he refers to something like that, he's speaking of the greater Boston area. Right. Thanks for clarifying that, Ed. But uh, he'd gone in and had an argument with the bank manager over it was a fee or something. And, and, I mean, the man's in his 70s at this point, and he turned right around and said, my grandfather, he said, you know what? I want all my money right now. And he took his money out of that bank, walked across the street, and never went back. And you know what? If you're not happy with your bank, I think you're absolutely right. Tell them to give your money right then and there to you and walk away. That's right. They're not the only game in town. No business is like that. You know, you don't need to go to McDonald's. Go to Burger King. You know, no business is the only game in town. Well, and I think that's one thing. I think it really took the entire economy crashing for us to realize that we're not victims of our bank. We don't have to be victims of our bank. And actually, speaking of victims, I don't know if you guys, I know uh, Tony and I were talking a little bit offline about the uh, the Herman Cain uh, Face the Nation quote today. Yep. He says, you know, that, that everybody in America, well, not everyone, but specifically the protesters on Wall Street said, oh, you're playing the victim card and you, you are jealous. Uh, he said, you're doing so out of jealousy of the corporate greed and the lack of jobs. He said, oh, you, you know, you, you're saying it's corporate greed and the lack of jobs, but you're just jealous. And I'm sorry, but telling someone who doesn't have a job that they're jealous of your big money job is not a good way to win votes. Yeah, but how many of those people are actually working? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I mean, most, no, most of those <laughs> protesters are students. They're, they're, they don't have jobs in the first place to go to. And, and I don't have a problem with that in and of itself, but, you know, I mean, uh, nobody, nobody on that line, or most of the people on that line, didn't take off from work to go protest. Correct. I mean, most of those they are, are college kids who don't have jobs anyway, so it's kind of an academic point. But I get there. I, I, the message is, you know, they want Wall Street to back down. Sure is. Okay, so enough with bashing Bank of America. Mm -hmm. I guess we're all going to move to credit unions, and I'm not afraid to say that in front of our national slash worldwide audience. Mm -hmm. Go to a credit union. As, as uh, Senator, what is it, Durkin from Illinois said, uh, walk, do not run, uh, run, do not walk away from Bank of America. Now, when senators are talking like that, there's a problem. And as we say on, as we say on, as we see it, that's how we see it. That's how we see it. So speaking of senators and uh, Herman Cain, uh, 
Tony and Holly, what did uh, we have coming up next? Sure. You know, Herman Cain has been surging in the polls lately, and he went from relatively a nobody uh, just a month, a month and a half ago, to now some polls have him tying with Romney, and some polls have him beating Mitt Romney, who was the front runner again, once tied with Rick Perry. And I think to give you a brief overview of Herman Cain, there's four reasons people really, really are running to Herman Cain. Number one, originality. He's got his 999 plan out there, which if you don't know, was a 9% corporate income tax, a 9% sales tax, and a 9% personal income tax. And he's winning points, even with moderates and liberals, on whether or not that's just for putting the original plan out there, just for something different. Clarity. You know, we talked earlier about his comment on Face the Nation. He was asked to clarify that statement about whether or not he felt that they were people who were just, you know, lazy or, or upset with Bank of America or, or jealous of corporate America. And he clarified it and said the exact same statement. And while people aren't agreeing with what he's saying, there's a lot of people out there saying, hey, here's finally somebody running for office that came up there, made a statement, was asked to clarify it, and made the same statement again. The other two things, he's got that outsider status, which people just love. There, two, you know, In the last clear congressional election, we had a lot of the anti-incumbent sentiment. And with congressional approval ratings hovering in the 10 to 12 percent range, people are really enjoying the fact that Herman Cain is just not a politician. And last but not least is likability. When you get to know Herman Cain, in the 2000 election, I should say, a lot of people liked George W. Bush because he was the guy they felt you could have a beer with. You know, you could invite him over to his house. I think a lot of people get that feeling with Herman Cain that, you know, he's somebody you could invite over to dinner and he's going to sit down with you and have dinner. Whereas Mitt Romney, which in full disclosure, I'm a fan of Mitt Romney, you know, you wonder if your China would be good enough for Mitt Romney. And is anybody here in race cards with Herman Cain or have we broke that mold now since we already have an African-American president? Well, I, I believe I believe actually that it could work against him because I, uh, you know, we we've been talking about this a lot around my house and around with the people that I, you know, do business with. And and actually, truth told, I, I think the Republicans are a little afraid to run to run. I, I think they're almost afraid to run as, as terrible as this is to say. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's a good time in our country when we're talking about running a black candidate against a black candidate. And I like the fact that people are even are not even saying it out loud as often as they should. But the truth of the matter is that's a fear for the Republicans because you do, you already have someone in office who who was an outsider. I mean, you know, he was only a first year congressman when he moved up when he moved up to president. You know, I mean, that was a big thing that was the appeal behind Obama. And a lot of the things that work in Kane's favor also worked for Obama on many other levels, not just the very basic run of the mill you know, stupid everyday, you know, race card level. He was considered an outsider. He was considered an upstart. He was considered a non-politician. And we enjoyed that about him. And I, yeah, I think it yeah. makes Kane a danger. You know, Holly, I have a problem, though, with Obama on a lot of levels. But one of them is that he's not black. He's mulatto. And whether you like that term or not, his mother is still white. Right, which makes him, if he was smart, a man for the entire, for everybody, whites, blacks as well, because he can say I'm part of your community. And I find it offensive when people just call him a black president. Well, I, I mean, I think I, I think I have full respect for that. And I think that is one of the beautiful things that he's such an applicable candidate. But I also say, I mean, you know, listen, I grew up in East Texas and no, nobody in this country is full blooded one thing or another. We're all a mix of something. And and you you cannot tell me that there was not that. I mean, I, I can tell you that a lot of the kids I grew up with had heritage on both sides of the line and it didn't help them any with the racist community. I mean, it, it exists and it's unfortunate and it's sad. And the challenges that come with that don't lighten up any just because you happen to have one white mother or grandmother. It, it doesn't it doesn't change the way that people who are inherently a little big, a bit ignorant view you. You know what I mean? I wish it did. I wish as a matter of oh, fact, yeah. I wish they cared. I know wish no I wish we weren't even having this conversation, but the truth of the matter is it does come into play. It's a factor. Oh it I'm does. Sure. It does. I think you're absolutely right. In the, in the case of Herman Cain, whether or not, you know, you can't you saying that, you know, the President Obama is, is black or he's not black or he's mulatto. I think Herman Cain's story as a black American, and he describes himself, I believe, as American first, uh, black second, and conservative third. Herman Cain grew up in the South. He grew up in Georgia during the period of segregation. He was told as a child, you know, this is the fountain. You, this is the white fountain you're not supposed to drink from. This is the black fountain. You know, this is your fountain. So I think Herman Cain's story as a black American is just a bit more authentic than President Obama's. And I'm not saying that President Obama tried to portray himself as, you know, a hero of the civil rights movement by any mean or, or a typical black American. But I think there are a lot of blacks out there that might look at this and say, hey, Herman Cain's family history, his story much more mirrors theirs 
Whereas President Obama grew up in it, and I'm not trying to knock the president, but he grew up with educated parents, he lived overseas, he went to private schools. Herman Cain, I think, has what's somewhat more identifiable as a more authentic, and I'm saying that with uh, rabbit ear quote marks, uh, American story. And I think people have really picked up on that. No, I agree. And I, I think one of the things that I've heard the most from, you know, the people I grew up with is that same uh, sort of dissonance on on the on the portrayal of of Obama, you know, is that, you know, he is so educated. He's not the normal story. And and it does make it difficult for them to ide- identify with him. But on the same t- at this on the same token, you know, as a voter, you've got to listen to what they're saying on the issues and what they're saying on the issues are quite different. Although, thank God, I think where Herman Cain does have an advantage is at least he's putting something forward. The Republicans in this entire debate over the debt crisis have really just said, well, we're not going to do what you want to do, but we're not going to give you any ideas either. And I like that Herman Cain has brought something to the table. You know, it's funny, we, Fred. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that with his uh, 999 plan. I had a friend of mine who is a CPA and uh, actually has a master's degree in taxation, if you can imagine anything more uh, boring or droning than that. But uh, he <laughs> took a look through Herman Cain's plan and he said, you know, I'm not 100% sure if it works. He's like, and I'm not sure personally if I like it. This founder of mine is fairly liberal. Herman Cain, as we know, is conservative. He says, but I really do give him credit for putting something out there, for trying something different. And whether or not his plan goes forward, I think you're right. A lot of people are giving him credit for saying something other than, well, let's raise taxes, let's cut taxes, let's regulate more, let's regulate less. And I mean, Herman Cain's towing the Republican line on that, but here's a new and different way of doing that. I think that's what's resonating with a lot of Republicans. Well, you know, I'm I'm excited about the, the Herman Cain debate. I think he adds something interesting to the competition, but... I think it's important to say something interesting has also been taken away from the competition this week. I believe Palin finally said definitively she is not going to run after she's after saying earlier that she was indefinitely not going to run. And then uh, and then on top of that, we have Christy pulling out of the race. Ed and Fred, I know you guys are devastated. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> poor guy. I'm going to miss him. Well, you know, let me make a comparison here that, that's going to shock some people between Sarah Palin and, uh, and Rudy Giuliani. If you remember back, I, I, I like Rudy. I, I do too. If you remember back to the last presidential election, Rudy had this weird strategy of saying, you know, if he can win, I think it was Florida and California, he would, you know, that's the only two states he was going to try for. And the real reason was, is Rudy realized if people are going to vote for him overwhelmingly, he'll go for it. If not, it's not worth it to him. Why? He can make a ton of money in the private sector and private citizen Rudy Giuliani can get paid, you know, he can get hotel rooms, he can get flights here and there, he can do high-level consulting work, he can do whatever he wants, and it's perfectly legitimate. I guess that's also why he didn't run for governor. Exactly. Uh, You know, Cuomo ended up becoming governor. I I don't know, maybe Giuliani couldn't even beat Cuomo in his home state now, but uh, that's probably a reason he didn't run for that either. Exactly, and I think with Sarah Palin, it's very similar. On the one hand, you know, she's only 47, I think she's 47 years old, so given the fact that Ron Paul is 76, Sarah Palin has 30 years of presidential campaigns she can jump in. Oh, she's a hell of a lot cuter than the rest of the people, too. (laughs) <laughs> That's true. But, uh, yeah, but she, come on, cute does not a good president make. I didn't. I, you didn't hear me say that. I just said she's cuter than the rest of them. You know, she has a chance to make a ton of money, and you know what? She's not a kingmaker, but she can have an impact on the race. She can decide who she likes. She can go after somebody with impunity because that's the role she can play, not getting into the race. I think if she jumped into the race and lost the nomination or even won the nomination and lost the presidency— Then she could be finished. Then she potentially has no more career. Her career would be done, whereas you know what? She's going to make a couple million dollars next year and the year after and the year after. Yeah, there's nothing I like less than hearing that Sarah Palin's going to make a couple million dollars this coming year. I'm going to drop out of business school now. And I guess right. I'm going to drop out of business school now, move to Alaska, and buy a gun. I guess Michelle Bachman is done, huh? I think she's going to be beautiful. Yeah, she's probably going to drop within a few weeks. She's out of money. She's not getting anything in the polls, and the traction was just gone. And that's something that could have happened to Sarah Palin or even Chris Christie, where they get in and they're doing well, and then you know a month or two later, your campaign's in the gutter, and what do you do from there? You you wasted sort of all your political capital on a run that failed a month in. I mean, that might be what's happening with Rick Perry. Well, and you know, it makes my head spin, you know, how many people step up to the plate for this. I mean, how many people who seem to have relatively successful careers, because it's really expensive to run for president, no matter who you are. It's costly. It costs you your own money. It costs you every bit of capital you ever have for, for, from your friends. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's right, an expensive... Just, it's, it's, it's interesting. If you look at the Republican field, a lot of them are either young enough that it doesn't matter, they can come back in 10 or 20 years, 
Or, you know, you look at a Ron Paul, who he's probably looking at his last chance. Rick Perry, Mitt Romney, if Romney doesn't get in this time, I think he's probably going to call it a day. He spent several million dollars of his own money. And uh, same thing with Bachman. I mean, she could always come back. I don't think that's going to happen. But Palin and Christie, and Christie's only 49 years old, and even though he didn't get in the race, these people can come back in 10 or 20 years. And I think it's anyone, you know, somebody like Rick Santorum's a young guy. He's running because he can do it. He gets the experience. He gets his name out there. And if he fails, he comes back in 10 years. Nobody's going to remember. Well, you know what? You could you could put this down in your little red book or whatever, that should the Republicans lose this time around, uh, Chris Christie's going to be it in 2016. Oh, that w- I w- that wouldn't surprise me at all. I think the reason Christie didn't run is only having served two years in New Jersey, he wouldn't get reelected. If no, he, he lost would. the nomination or if he – you still think if he, if he you know, left the state to run for president, lost the nomination or lost the general, you think he'd get reelected as governor? No, he, he, he wouldn't have a prayer getting reelected in New Jersey. Oh, yeah, okay. so that's how I see it, that should the Republicans lose in 2012, it's going to be Christie in 2016. Mm, I don't know. I think the Republicans are saving their big guns for 2016. What's what's a big gun? I I, I don't I don't have to like him, but I think Chris Christie's a big gun. Really? Yeah, yeah. With the party. I don't know about that. I'll have to think on that one because I, I I'm still I still have sour feelings about uh about election politics in the Republican Party since Elizabeth Dole, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, speaking of speaking of governors, if we can get off of this one. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown yesterday in California signed into law something called the Dream Act or something, allowing illegal aliens, and I love that term, illegal aliens to get in-state breaks on college tuition, making uh, joining several other uh, states in the union and doing that. You know, I'm going to point something out real quick. California is over $50 billion in debt. He can sign whatever papers he doesn't want. It's not going to help them. California is a failed state. But it had nothing to do. With, it had nothing to do with that. My issue with that is not the fact that California is fifty billion dollars. I think the stupid bill was signed. If you have foreign debt, what I have a problem with is that he's that that again. Once again, they're rewarding people for breaking the law. You know, it's funny. That's something that killed Perry in one of the debates because he came up and said that you know he he'd signed it in Texas or he supported it. I think if Perry had been smart in what uh, Jerry Brown over in California could do is they could turn around and say, look, and I don't agree, I don't, in full disclosure, I don't agree with it either, but he could say, look, these are state universities. This money goes to state taxpayers who reside in the state. They're not citizens. The federal government's not doing their job. And that would be a good, you know, so somebody like Jerry Brown or Rick Perry could have come back and hit back with that. And people, I think, would have said, you know, you're right. It, it, you know, blame it on the federal government. Again, I don't agree with it, but I think politically that would have possibly saved Perry's uh, short presidential career. You yeah, bet. Well. I, I think I think that would have been a great thing for Perry to say, and I think it would have been a great thing for Brown to say if it, if this comes up in that sort of uh, arena. But you know what's more important? The reason they're doing this is, it, and the reason I think you're right, I think it's a failure of the fe- federal government that these people are not either you know home or becoming citizens is because. These, if it, they say, you know, right underneath this story, if you look on, uh, if you look on some of the websites that I'm looking on, you know, they're talking about how immigrant kids in other states just don't go to school because they're not getting, they're not getting money, they're not getting whatever. So then, what do they do? They're on the street. You're talking crime. You're talking, you're talking those lower paying jobs being taken by them, which means they can't afford to get by in a in a regular day society. And then, and then it becomes the whole drain situation with welfare that we're talking about. They're just trying. They're just trying to. If they're going to be in the state anyway, they need to be profitable. Why not send them back to their home country? Let their home country worry about it. I don't. I don't think you understand what the repercussions are of sending people back to their home country who come to America. All of us here are immigrants. You do realize that. I may be a third generation immigrant, but I'm an immigrant. But We're all you're, immigrants here. But no, your but your ancestors came here just like mine did and did it legally. Correct. And perhaps maybe someday these people will be able to be legal as well. But when you've been, thing, when but you've the, been here for 25 <laughs> years, you have no intention of being legal. The but the political turmoil that drives people to America. You don't want to send them back to their countries to cause more political turmoil. You do realize because we're in an increasingly international uh, world, both in business as well as in everything else that we do, everything that every other country does is affecting us, it, it, it becomes a big problem to send people back to dissension because you basically are just feeding an already an already huge problem that's crossing our borders every day of the week. Oh, and no, I understand that. And in <laughs> some cases, we're quasi-responsible for those problems. That may be true, but a lot of these people could apply for asylum, 
and sure. that's very different than just sort of, uh, you know, hopping on over the fence and, and, you know, going to pick some grapes. And, you know, I think you got to look, if you look at, and, and this is a perfect example of where it is our fault, but you look at some of the Iraqi immigrants that have come in the last uh, five or ten years, and again, something you can blame on the U.S. if you want, but you've had incidents of them, you know, engaging in honor killings and whatnot in, in other, you know, countries as well. And you look at it and you wonder what they're bringing from their country here. My grandmother and myself immigrated from Greece about, at this point, 60 years ago. But, you know, there's always been that sort of American agreement that, you know, you leave the best of your country behind and bring the best and the food, in my opinion, uh, here to the United States. And, and you wonder whether or not some of these people are really adapting and, and melting in and, and bringing the best of what they had to offer. I, I, think, I think that's a good point. I mean, it's an excellent point, although I do say that, you know, when you come to a country uneducated and unable to speak the language, especially if you're unable to speak the language, regardless of how educated you are, you know, I, I'm in business school now, and 30% of the people who are in business school with me are internationals, and they have a much harder time finding a job than I do, even if they speak English perfectly, because it's difficult for them to connect with the con with the companies that will hire them and help sponsor them. So, I mean, you're talking the top tier intelligence from other countries coming into a master's program in business administration who find it hard to find a job, and you think it's easy for some guy who just ran across the border who's maybe a farmer in his home country who doesn't speak any English to become a legitimate citizen? It's not as easy as we'd like to think. Well, part of the problem and part of that problem is that we teach that we're allowing that not that we're allowing, but that we're teaching foreign students in foreign languages in American schools. And now they're not acclimating the parents or the kids to English in the school system. They go from a Spanish, uh, a foreign speaking home, most likely in a lot of times Spanish, to a Spanish speaking neighborhood, to a Spanish speaking school, back to a Spanish speaking home. And they don't learn. They don't learn English as the language of the country that they're in. Well, my mother, my parents both are both came from other countries. My mother was born here. My father was not. Both of them learned to speak the language language the country they were in and adapted to the country that they were in. I mean, that's what you do. My father joined the U.S. military to get his American citizenship. And my mother was born in this country, was raised in Switzerland, because her father got called, recalled, but they were all here legally. And every person that, 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 that applied, and I think the, the immigration shouldn't take five years, shouldn't take 97,000 uh, uh, visits to the immigration office, but the laws have to be changed. But in the meantime, you got people here that are coming over the border, having kids in this country because of the American citizenship and that the kids get and the benefits. Then we can't get rid of them. And that's cost the taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars. Well, I mean, inevitably, yes, but the problem is, is the same people who don't want those immigrants crossing the borders are the same people blocking legislation to make it easier for them to become immigrants. And they're also blocking legislation to put money into the kind of programs that would help get them here legally. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a slippery slope. It's a difficult line to walk. I think they shouldn't they have to make more, wait more than a year and do two or three interviews. You can get somebody to sponsor you. you let them in. By all means, let them in. That's yeah, I, I think so too. But I think the problem is, is that the same people who say that these people need to go through the proper channels are the people who are making that difficult. It's actually the exact same. It's usually the exact same congressperson. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, and with that, uh, I just want to remind everybody again that uh, keep an eye out for our new political show, Viewpoint, <laughs> coming up shortly. Uh, we're hoping within the next few weeks. This wasn't it being able to get something going um, with Tony Mazzucco, and hopefully we'll get somebody else on the panel. We still don't know if that's going to be uh, an audio podcast or a video show, but either way, look for Viewpoint on BaseNet Internet Television um, through the election season, and uh, should be an exciting show. Moving along here to our little uh, Holly and the Lobster reunion, um, Holly and Larry, what do we uh, need to speak about here? I was thinking uh, about talking about the license plate readers, which a lot of licensed drivers here in Brookline seem to think that's an invasion of privacy if the car's parked on the street. And where are, thinking, these, where are these license plate readers? These license plate readers are mounted on the dashboard of Brookline police cars, and they'll slowly drive along the street, and they'll photograph the rear plates of the parked cars and as I said they think that's an invasion of privacy and if your car is parked on a public street it is not an invasion of privacy yeah are, are they are they running every plate on the street or are they running random license plates 
I don't really know. I, I ne- we, we have a clip here. Let's go to the clip, and then after the clip, uh, I'll pick it up from it. Okay. Criminals in cars, watch out. There is a new high-tech tool police are using that can check out a license plate in record time. Stolen license plate. This is a scaff law. law or other right, violation. Right, right, right Suspended or revoked. I would bet to say that it's at least doubled our, our stats as far as arrests go because how many cars you wouldn't have ran the tag if it didn't see it because you couldn't see it nighttime. That alone. With the headlights and everything, it's reading through all that mess. You can't beat that. It's nice. It's so efficient that when we pulled over these two undocumented workers, Powers had a marked patrol car come so he can take the eyes that never miss a thing back on the road. At 15 plates a second, it's doing, you know, the work of five, six officers with five or six computers. So apparently from what we saw in the clip, Fred, going back to your question, it kind of shows that they just let this device run and the re- this device is scanning, according to this clip, uh, it's got an infrared, it's like an infrared device, so it'll read plates in rain at night, uh, you know, in all kinds of inclement weather and whatnot. And it looks like it just scans every plate that, you know, as the police car is going past it. And as we heard in the clip, it'll say, violator, violator, if, and, you know, something comes you up. You know, I, I mean, I don't know if I have a problem with this or not. I mean, look, my, my registration's paid. I'm not breaking a lot. I understand what they're doing and why, but I don't know if I really want these guys running my license plate 14 times a day every time I go past a police car either. I like you know, it. I like it, but I'm just, you know, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just... Go ahead. Who else likes it? I'm alone. <laughs> the chief stands alone. <laughs> oh, actually, no, actually, I like that idea. Why do you like it, Larry? I think that they should have, I think they should continue doing it. I mean, like I said, cars parked on the public street, you know, just let them drive along and photograph each license plate. Back to the theory, driving in general is a, um, is a privilege, right, it's a, right. a privilege, right? You have well, to not- prove that you deserve a driver's license. Well, more importantly, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily think that it's going to be good for what they think it's going to be good for, you know, catching stolen cars and catching, you know, catching certain kinds of things. I mean, yeah, I, I would imagine using trouble. Larry's example of Brookline, Massachusetts, not to say there aren't stolen vehicles in Brookline, but it's not Camden, New Jersey, which at one time was the, the you know, the capital of the world for stolen vehicles. Uh, cops could go up and down the streets of Brookline all day and all night, and how many stolen vehicles are they going to find? Right. I think where it's more helpful is, as I said in the news clip, you know, they're catching people with expired registrations. They're catching people who are trying to kind of dodge the system. And the truth of the matter is, is I don't know about you, Larry. big brother to me. Well, you you can call it big brother, but you know it's kind of like you know it's kind of like Larry said and like the clip said, you know the 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 driving without a registration, driving without a license, driving uninsured. These things are usually done for a reason, and they're usually uh, people who have certain kinds of infringements on their records. And also, the this small amount of money that they get from those level of infractions are one of the reasons why the why in Massachusetts we don't have to pay taxes on things like clothing and food. And I, for one, am willing to make the trade. So catch the people who aren't, who aren't, you know, renewing their registration and giving their money to Massachusetts and making. I, I had to I, does it? Yeah. You know, what I like about, I like part of that about. I just don't. I mean, every time you drive past a police car, you drive past, they're running your plate, which doesn't really matter. I guess I don't know. It just. It, so I mean, so, I think so it, do you, Fred? Then idea. do you, Fred? Then think that it should be just like uh, roadside random checks where it needs to be a pattern before they set up their roadside check. And I know this for a fact, they have to set up um, that before they set up the roadside check, they have to determine, they have to say, okay, you know what? The chief said, we're going to stop every fourth car. We're going to stop every sixth car. There has to be a discernible pattern. Uh, well, no, so I, do you I'm think saying, there should be a pattern then, or should it just randomly search, scan every plate? No, well, I mean, it can scan every plate, but once a plate's been run, don't keep running it. I mean, I don't know how the system works. I mean, you know, the thing, but I'm saying if you run my plate, May, yeah, maybe once every 24 hours or something. Yeah, you run my plate. I mean, if you see, my, if I drive by, by 16 
Brookline police cars, you're going to run my plate 16 times. I mean, that that that's a, that's a waste of equipment. Yeah, I, I would almost think that the software would uh, default to it only runs it once a day or something. I, and I would hope so. I mean, I like the idea of catching, because there are people who are running, like Holly said, they're running on uh, unregistered vehicles. They're running vehicles that have been, that, that are running out of state plates when they're not supposed to be. And, you know, registration in Pennsylvania, just like Massachusetts, isn't cheap. And, you know, we just had to change all our addressing from a 911 uh, re-addressing program here in Pocono Township. And, you know, they're giving you a year to get it done. But, I mean, all of this, you know, has to – and I like, I like the idea of a lot of it. I just don't want – I mean, in, when you when they're running random license plates, they got a random button. That they're pushing the random button. So it shows like it's random stop. They're not – they're running every plate out there anyway. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I, I just – you know, I think it's another tool that if used properly – is going to be, you know, is, is going to be phenomenal. But, I mean, where, you know, where's the abuse factor in it, and what are they going to do about it? So, Larry, I hear you also have a pet peeve about bicycles on sidewalks. You want to tell us about that? Oh, I most certainly do, because <laughs> uh, it's a real pain. You know, sometimes, you know, just walk along, you just walk along the sidewalk, and the next thing you know, a bike flies by you, and I figure, you know, you want to ride your bike? You share the road with the motor vehicles. Keep your bike off the sidewalk. Anybody good, agree with uh, Larry? Well, that's a good point, Larry, but there are certain sections of most cities. Now, I've, I've never ridden a bicycle in Boston, but I'm sure there are some sections where people go out in the street and they get killed. Now, yeah, okay, they need to watch out, need to get some kind of warning, but if, they, if there are areas like that, maybe the city should designate a section of the sidewalk, if it's wide enough, as a bike lane or designate bike lanes in the streets so the bikes stay in the street. And, yeah. and also ages. Well, I was giving Larry an example a couple of weeks ago how in the town that I grew up in, in Bergen County, New Jersey, suburban community, um, my street didn't even have sidewalks, but the rest of pretty much the rest of the town did. I was told by my mother or father when I went to ride on the bike, stay on the sidewalk. I better not just see your ass on the street. All right. You know, and I'm talking when I was, early, you know, early teens or in, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. I was specifically told, go ahead and ride your bike, but you better stay on the sidewalk. And I can understand that. You know, the eight year old kid is a lot safer on the sidewalk, I would think, than in the middle of the street. Yeah. And most of a lot of the kids I mean, don't know that you ride the direction of the vehicle is not against it anyway. Right. So Go ahead, Larry. Well, but they, they should be taught before they get on the street. I mean, as a cyclist, I have really strong feelings about this, and as a driver, as a driver as well. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, in in Boston, and I'm sure, in I'm sure in some cities in Philly, it's this way too. But it's like, you know, if you you should have to know what the laws are for a bicyclist, which are to follow the same laws as traffic, if you're going to be able to ride a bike. And I mean, I, I'm on the fence about it, as Ed was saying, you know. I mean, it's got to be difficult to teach your, teach your kid to ride a bike in a place like Boston. You have to find like, you know, you got to take them to the commons or something to teach them because it's just there's no safe place for them to drive because it is not safe for cyclists in Boston. I know maybe three people who've been like, you know, I can't say aside for myself. I know anybody who rode bikes in Boston and never got hit. Larry, what were you going to say? Or do you have a comment was, about the young kids? I was just going to say I'm in agreement with kids, you know, that are, say, you know, eight, nine, or ten, riding on the sidewalk. I have no problem with that. But when they're old enough to ride the bike, fine. Then they share the road with the motor vehicles. And okay, Brooklyn, yeah, so maybe maybe, maybe a like a driver's age, age or limit. something. Yeah, if you're 17 or whatever it is in Massachusetts um, or whatever state, if you're 17 and you already possess or could possess a driver's license, then you don't ride your bike on the sidewalk anymore. And that makes a lot of, of sense. Age. Yeah. Keeping kids under the age of 12 or 14 on the sidewalk and then putting them in the street makes sense because they should have more common sense by then. That I can agree with. Well, I think Larry's got himself a good pet peeve there. Okay. So, and also, yeah, right. and one more thing, um, in a lot of, and practically in several sections of Brookline, there are bike lanes everywhere in the street. Yeah, I, but I, 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 still think that's a, I still think that's a towing cost. That yes, there's bike lanes and there's I'm sure huge legal ramifications if you're involved in an accident, uh, you know, motorist versus bicycle, when the bicycle was in fact in a bike lane. But still, I would personally have a problem telling, say, if I had a 10-year-old kid, go ride in the street, but just make sure you stay in the bike lane because you're going to be safe. 
all you guys know as well as I do that you're going to get that random idiot that's going to plow into that kid, whether the kid's in the bike lane or not. Or the guy who's going to who's gonna park in the bike lane, then the kid has to, has to go around them anyway. Right, right. right. oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole there's a whole line of terrible things that can happen, which is why in the case of children, it's it makes it very difficult. It's very I would say it, living in a city and have and having your kids ride a bike is just a it's just a scary thing. Sure well, that's why I remember going to Boston where uh, we were riding on the T and people were bringing the bikes onto the T because, you know, it, it was faster for them to get to the park and go ride in the park. Mm-hmm. And they're doing that in a lot of areas. I mean, New Jersey's allowing that on the uh, light rail going from Trenton down to some of the Yeah, you, up, up here you just can't do it during rush hour. They're not allowed on the train during rush hour. But in non-peak times you can bring bikes on the train. And all of the MBTA buses have bike racks on the front. They hold two or four bikes. Um, so now you could now put your bike on the front of the bus even, and you could, that way the bike stays outside of the bus, you go on the bus, and then you take it off the rack when you get where you're going. That's a great idea. Okay. Well, thanks for that uh, suggestion, Larry. It was a couple good topics there, and uh, thank you very much for joining Holly and us here for our little reunion, and uh, hopefully... Uh, you know, you could join us a little more often as well. Well, we're going to close out on a little bit of a sad note. We normally close out as we see it with obituaries. Unfortunately, uh, this week was the obituary of all obituaries. If you're involved in the tech community at all, which obviously we all are since we're on internet television. And chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you're somewhat of a techie. So of course I'm talking about Steve Jobs. Um, Let's, let's just start this off with a clip. Um, I have a Leo Laporte being interviewed by Wolf Blitzer on CNN. Apple headquarters in California. People are mourning there also right here in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. at the Apple Store. Uh, people all over the world are mourning the loss of Steve Jobs. Uh, Leo Laporte is the host of uh, the nationally syndicated Tech Guy radio show on Premier Radio Networks. He's the founder of his own internet-based technology network this week in tech. He's interviewed Steve Jobs many times. Leo, what goes through your mind on this sad day? You know, we were so prepared for this. We knew it was coming, uh, and yet it's still such a shock, and it's so sad. And I'm really trying to focus on celebrating his life. This is a guy who lived his life exactly as he wanted to. Uh, Waz uh, said that uh, Steve exceeded every goal he ever set for himself. He's a guy who who lived his dreams and changed our lives as a result. What, what made him so amazing? Was it his education? Was it his family? Was it his background growing up in California? There must have been some spark there that created this genius. What, is, what are the ingredients that make somebody like that? You know, he was a college dropout. It wasn't his education. I think there was a, something inside him that drove him to, to exceed. He didn't care what other people thought. He cared about making great stuff. And he succeeded uh, every step of the way. He, he stumbled, occasionally made mistakes. He wandered in the wilderness after being fired at Apple. And yet he kept coming back. And I think it was his extraordinary drive that really made him the man he is. So in your interviews with him, what was he like as a, as a person? Was he easy to get along with? Did he, did he like to chat? Did he talk about sports or baseball or something? Or was he simply <laughs> focused oh, on no. technology? Steve was very focused. There's a famous story about him coming into a conference room and somebody starting to chat about the weekend and him saying, can we raise the tone of conversation here? He was a get-to-work guy. When Steve walked in the room, it was really apparent immediately that he knew he was the smartest guy in the room. Usually, he was absolutely right. He was, he was down to earth. And, and later, in the last few years, he really didn't do very many interviews. He didn't trust the press. He didn't like the press. He wanted to control, very tightly control, uh, the image of Apple and his own image. He, he, he was a control freak in, in every sense of the word, and yet he inspired us all. I mean, uh, without Steve Jobs, you wonder, where's the excitement going to come from in this industry? Okay. Uh, Leo Laporte, as Wolf said, um, has his nationally syndicated radio show, The Tech Guy, and of course he's the founder of This Week in Tech, the Twit TV network, and... I'll give a little disclaimer that the only reason, the only reason that Basin and Internet Television exists today is because of Leo Laporte. Uh, a huge fan of his forever, and uh, that's why we're here. 
That so so we wanted to play that little clip of um, Leo's thoughts on Steve. And um, we'll open it up to the rest of you guys now. Any thoughts on on Steve? And then, uh, Holly, I think you also brought a clip with you, but you could explain. Uh, yeah, I did. I did bring a clip, and I think we're going to close the show with it today. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, for better or for worse, I know, you know, I'm talking Tony and I aside. I know that we're talking to a lot of PC guys here. You know, Steve Jobs, I mean, you know, born in 1955 in California, happened to be in the right place at the right time, if you believe Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, hmm, Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, um, you know, and actually was able to have significant hands-on experience with computers in a very, very early, you know, early era for them, you know, founded Apple, worked with the Waz, you know, and then resigned from Apple, or, I mean, under a first recognition, exactly, by uh, John Scully, who he hired, um, and then, you know, started Next, which gave us Pixar, and I don't know if any of you guys are Toy Story fans or Monsters, Inc. fans, but I certainly am, then became one of the, I believe he was the biggest shareholder in the Walt Disney Company. Very few people know that. That was yep. the trade he made for Pixar. And uh, and then went back to, to uh, you know, to Apple and was able to make them one of the most profitable Apple at, companies. Apple at that time, under Scully, was two months away from running out of money. And Steve Jobs, they, they ran back to Steve Jobs saying, could you help us out financially? We're like done in 90 days. And Steve Jobs went back and helped them out financially. They almost immediately named him an interim board member. And then within months, he was then CEO again. Well, and he, uh, you know, those of you who are into economics, uh, the PC industry at large is considered a perfect uh, perfect industry, which means basically it's nearly impossible to make money. The profit margins are very slim because everybody's providing a identical product, which means that almost everyone has to differentiate on price, and very few companies are making money. And Apple is actually considered outside of the market because of the model that he integrated when he came back in 1996. He's actually been able to make them their own market. They're not even considered a part of the personal device market. They're considered something outside of that because of his success and I mean you know you you look at a guy like that and you got to say you know for better or for worse in his personal life you know I don't know I don't know if I think that Steve Jobs was an upstanding ethical businessman you know he certainly wasn't the the icon of charity that Bill Gates has become but but he, he certainly did some amazing things and left some amazing marks that I don't think our world would be the same without him everybody has or has had or virtually everybody, some form of an iPod, even going way back to the first generation iPod. Everybody, or almost everybody, has had a Macintosh computer. I have. I've had, I had that, the first iMac, that bubble iMac, that spaceship mm -hmm. thing. Um, as a matter of fact, I was a beta tester for OS X when it was still running OS 9. We, we all had some roots in you know, in Apple, and we've all used Apple products, even if we currently don't. Um, if anybody uses Linux, it, it's based on the same same thing also, the Unix operating system. Unix and Apple virtually the same. Um, you know, then, like you said, look at the products that it spawned. The, uh, you know, the success of the iPhone and certainly the iPad, which the iPad has the tablet market sewn up right now. I mean, they got you have also iTunes and i everything. I mean, they they did the i in versus the i market, and you know, Steve. The only real thing I think that's going to happen is that now that Steve Jobs is gone, God rest his soul, may he rest in peace and all that good stuff. But and now you know, with Steve being gone, it's going to give the people over at Apple the opportunity to open up new markets for Apple products, like you know the, the like idea, Flash, like putting in Flash and. And being able to integrate more into the Windows uh, market with its own products, which I think would be a great idea for Apple. I think uh, just quickly, I think Steve Jobs is going to take his place among some of the great American entrepreneurs and inventors. And, you know, in 30 or 40 years from now, he may be a standard character in a, an economics textbook. And he's just a great American and he accomplished quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I don't know if you guys had more to add, but if not, I guess uh, maybe we'll close up and then I'll uh, lead into my clip. Yeah, I only, I only have one more thing. Like as, as it's become tradition is to close with a uh, an obituary. This week, Oscar nominee 
Diane Calento uh, died at 78 years old. I'm going to tell you who she was. She's the Oscar-nominated Australian actress who was once married to James Bond star Sean Connery. She died in Northern Australia, and she was 78 years old. We're going to pull some obscure stuff on these. But Salento was a veteran of dozens of film, television shows, and other stage productions. She died Thursday night in Queensland's uh, state premiere. Anne Bly said no cause of death was given. She rose to fame in the 50s and 60s, setting a... Um, Starring along such legends as Charlton Heston and Paul Newman. In 56, she was nominated for a Tony Award for her portrayal of Helen of Troy in the play Tiger at the Gates. So she was a very prolific actress. We do want to wish her family, as usual, wish her, wish them our best and, we, and hope that she uh, also, you know, goes where she's got to go. And that's all I got for the uh, obit. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us on this latest episode of As We See It. Next week, we're going to have a schedule change. I won't be available next Sunday, so we will be rescheduling uh, next week's uh, show recording date. So for those of you that listen to this show uh, on the Internet, um, it may or may not affect you because by the time you look for it on iTunes or any of the other locations, it'll probably be up. We're tentatively shooting for a Tuesday instead of Sunday. But uh, just follow us on Facebook or different locations, and you'll be able to find the updated um, scheduling information. Along those lines, you could follow us on Facebook. We are at BaseNet. On Twitter, we are at BaseNet TV. On Google+, Plus, which has really grown uh, exponentially. It's amazing how many new followers we've picked up just in the past week or two. You could follow myself, Edward A. Jupin, or you could follow Frederick Boaz. Um, Holly is starting to be on there. I guess Holly or Holly Hurley Feather. Uh, I'm actually just Holly Hurley. Okay. Um, so follow us on social media. You could email us at info at basenetintermedia.com. And I think that just about does it. Just got uh, one more thing. Go ahead. We do have we do have a new Twitter. Uh, the uh, Pennsylvania offices are up as BaseNet PA on Twitter. There you go. So you could contact Fred at BaseNet PA on Twitter. And, and I'd love for people to write in their opinions too. We might be able to read some of those on the show. Absolutely. So from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. From somewhere in the Pocono Mountains, actually from outside of Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. And, uh, and this is Holly Hurley, and we're going to close with uh, the immortal words of Steve Jobs from his 2005 graduation speech, or commencement speech, if you will, at Stanford University. Take it, Steve. When I was young, there was an amazing publication called the Whole Earth Catalog, which was one of the Bibles of my generation. It was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park, and he brought it to life with his poetic touch. This was in the late 60s, before personal computers and desktop publishing, so it was all made with typewriters, scissors, and Polaroid cameras. It was sort of like Google in paperback form 35 years before Google came along. It was idealistic, overflowing with neat tools, and great notions. Stuart and his team put out several issues of the Whole Earth Catalog, and then, when it had run its course, they put out a final issue. It was the mid-1970s, and I was your age. On the back cover of their final issue was a photograph of an early morning country road, the kind you might find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. It was their farewell message as they signed off. Stay hungry, stay foolish. And I have always wished that for myself. And now, as you graduate to begin anew, I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all very much.
Why don't we go to a clip right now of Herman Cain talking with Chris Wallace on Fox News? 